After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were out to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've shared this story before, but who knows what we've shared the last year in worship, right? about a congregation that I served back in the 90s, late 90s into the early 2000s. We had a woman in the congregation who was um, a reservist in the military. She was a nurse. She left active duty when she had her second child because she didn't want to be deployed, and it was during Desert Storm. She came to us and said, I'd like to do something for the soldiers because it weighs on my mind how much they give up for us. We all agreed, and she wanted to contact an organization that helped out soldiers. And I said, let's not do that. Let's call the United Methodist Church, because the Baltimore-Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church indeed had a chaplain serving in active duty in Iraq at the time. So we contacted him, and he said it would be great. And we said, what would you like? And it's getting close to Christmas, meaning it was about September, because when you look at mailing things for Christmas across the seas, you start very early. He said, we would love to have some Christmas cookies. And he said, there are 856 troops here in my unit. He said, I know you couldn't do anything for all 856, but what about the 56 of us who are at headquarters? And so we looked at it and said, 850, no, 56 times 12, that's a lot of cookies. And then I stood up that Sunday in the congregation in the pulpit, and I swear it was not me, it was the Holy Spirit who said, as I said, we need 56 dozen cookies, and people went, 56 dozen cookies, are you kidding me? I said, but what about the other 800? They're the ones who are really out in the field. They're the ones who need Christmas cookies. They're the ones who need to know that we're thinking of them. And I said, how hard could it be to bake 856 dozen cookies? Now, the head of my trustees there was a business manager in his day job, and he was a math major in college and an engineering major. And he said, hey, English major, I just did the math. That's nearly 11,000 cookies. And I said, What's 11,000 cookies among? What do we have, like 150 people here, 160? They said, yeah, you think the babies are all going to bake a dozen cookies? That's just how many families are going to bake cookies. I said, come on. We can do it. We can do it. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And someone said, you're crazy from the back. But we undertook the work. Now, I've told you that part of the story before. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened then. The youth group decided we were going to bake cookies. We are going to do a lot of the baking. We are going to take on the lion's share of the baking. So the youth leader and I went to Sam's Club. We didn't have one of those little carts that you push. We had one of those big carts with 25 pound bags of flour and sugar. And you know how many pounds of chocolate chips it takes to make 300 <laughs> cookies? 36 pounds of chocolate chips. Now, don't do that math or you'll really get yourself scared. But we started to bake cookies. Luckily, the principal of the local high school was a member of the congregation. I could just say to him, please, please, please. Also, the head cook from the high school cafeteria was a the member there. So we went to the high school to bake cookies. We started baking cookies as soon as school let out. We were going to bake until probably 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. We were there till midnight. And 800 cookies later, we thought, how in the world is this ever going to happen? 
because it took that long to bake 800 cookies. Now, the teenagers were all excited at first. When you're baking cookies to send overseas, they tell you to bake them halfway so they don't get too stale. So the youth leader and I each shared a cookie to see if we thought it was done enough. And the kids said, that's not fair. We want cookies. By the end of the evening, nobody cared if they ever saw a cookie again, smelled a cookie again, tasted a cookie again. That was the one year everyone in the church lost weight because we were so tired of cookies. I can't tell you how many days we spent at the high school baking and how many people baked at home till the time we finally sent the cookies out. And guess how many we sell? I think we hit 11,000? 14,000 cookies went to Iraq. Hold on to that story for a moment. We're going to talk about this one now, and then we're going to make a little bit of a jump for you here. I asked you what's different about this story. It takes place at the Passover. Did you notice that? In the other Gospels, it does not take place anywhere near the Passover. And if you remember, Jesus' Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels happened at the Passover, or near the Passover, as they were preparing for the Passover. And in John's Gospel, the night that Jesus dies, he does something different that he doesn't do in the other Gospels. Who can tell you what happens in chapter 13 of John's Gospel that doesn't happen anywhere else the night before he dies? What does he do to the disciples? He washes their feet. Thank you, John. He washes their feet. But what he doesn't do there is to say, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. There is no institution of Holy Communion at all in John's Gospel. Most biblical scholars believe that this story we just read is that beginning of Holy Communion, that sacrament of Christ's presence with us, that sacrament of his self-giving love for us, because it happens at the Passover. And what does he do in this story that's different? He takes the bread, he gives thanks to it, he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he shares it with them himself. Now we're talking 10,000 people that Jesus himself serves. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? That's why we call it a miracle. But John doesn't call it a miracle. What does John call it? A sign. This is a sign of who Christ is for us. This is a sign of the depth of God's love for us. This is the sign that points us in the direction of a loving, redeeming God who would not let anything get in the way of bringing us home into the loving care of our Father. Powerful story. Why I love to tell it again and again and again. Now, you would think that that crowd would be mostly Jewish folks. And they didn't follow him. They didn't follow him because of this overwhelming feeling that he was the son of God, although some of them probably hoped he might be the son of God or a prophet of God. They followed him because he had healed sick people in a day when if you could afford a doctor, you wouldn't want to see one because they didn't know what they were doing. The only people who had physicians were royalty. The upper, upper classes could consult a physician, but who wants to see a physician in the first century? Probably not many. You'd have to be pretty sick to want to see someone who could do you probably more harm than good. But if you had a sick child or if someone you loved needed help and you had heard that this man, this carpenter's son from Galilee, had done these miraculous things, he had healed the sick, he had touched people, he had called the dead back to life, and you had someone you loved who was in need, you would do anything you could to get to him. And they came to him, and they came to him, and they came to him. That's where we pick up the story today, because he looks up and he says something that makes no sense to anybody. He says, where are we going to feed? How are we going to feed these people? We've got to feed them, don't we? Now, 10,000 people. If you've ever been to Disney World, you know what a crowd is. Or if you've been to Camden Yards, we're talking about a quarter of Camden Yards being full. And when there's only a quarter of Camden Yards full, it looks pretty empty. But that's still a lot of people, 10,000 people. And in this story, it's Jesus who feeds them as a sign of who he is and what he is here for. I don't know if that meant he literally went around and gave the bread to everyone and the fish to everyone. But the disciples, at least, the 12 who had been with him, who had seen all these things firsthand, should have known what he was able to do. But even they're amazed. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew has two great moments in scripture. This is one, and when he says to his brother, come and see who I just met, is the other. But he says, there's a kid here with his lunch. But what could that possibly do? Five little barley loaves and two fish to feed so many. Now, 
you know what kind of fish mostly they fished for in the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias? The ones that we call sardines. That's what they fished for, little bitty fish. And a barley loaf was not a barley loaf. It was a little round piece of bread because how did bread get baked in those days? On a hot stone. You didn't go to the bakery. There was no 24-hour Walmart. There was no bakery in the area. There was no place if they had the money to buy that kind of bread. There was no way to feed that crowd other than through faith in God the Father. Jesus had plenty of that. And so he takes what is offered. We don't know if the little boy said, here, take what I have. I, I choose to think it's that way. And so somebody said, look, the kid's got food and grab it away from him. I don't know if I had thought to bring my own meal, if I would be so fast to share it. But Jesus takes it and he gives thanks using the words that I will speak for Holy Communion. He gives thanks to God and he shares it and they eat and there's plenty left. They should have remembered the story that we read before, the story that we read from Exodus. God appeared to Moses, how? In the burning bush. God says, I've seen the suffering of my people. I have come down to deliver them. This is what I need you to do. I always think that's a great story. God says, I've come down to deliver them. I'm going to deliver them right through you, Moses. And Moses is like, what are you talking about, Lord? Just like the disciples, huh? How? How in the world can this happen? Can you imagine being a slave in Egypt? Can you imagine being a slave anywhere? No, we can't. We cannot wrap our heads around it. Don't even think you can pretend to know what it was like for people who were enslaved. And in Egypt, in the desert, where it's hot all day and it's cold at night, where they're making bricks and then making bricks without straw, where they're being beaten and abused. And Moses goes and sets his face to Pharaoh and says, God says, let my people go. Even Moses wasn't sure because he says, who should I say is sending me? God says, I am. I am. And this is what I need you to do. And Moses goes and he confronts the Pharaoh. You know the story, you know the plagues, the plagues of the cicadas and all this other, no, that one, one wasn't. And the people finally are allowed to be free. And what do free people do as soon as they get out into the desert? They start whining. Are we there yet? 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 Oh, Moses, did you bring us here to kill us? At least when we were in Egypt, we had meat to eat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Oh, Moses, how could you do this to us? We were better off as slaves. You think they were better off as slaves? I don't think so. If I had been God, I would have said, then just die in the desert, you ingrateful people. It's a good thing I'm not God, right? Because what does God do but rain down manna from heaven, bread from heaven to feed them, quails. And God says to them, eat as much as you need for that day, unless it's the Sabbath, because the Sabbath we don't work. We rest on the Sabbath. We devote our lives to God on the Sabbath. The night before the Sabbath, you can collect up twice that you need for the next day. But they wanted to hedge their bets again, and yet they collected a little bit more and stuck it away. And what happened when they looked into it the next day? Oh, it was not worth eating because it was filled with bugs and disease and rot, nasty stuff. And why would they try to do what God didn't want them to do? Because they did not know to trust God. The disciples hadn't quite learned that yet, had they? On that hillside, when they looked at all those people, they looked at Jesus, they knew Jesus, they knew what he had done, they'd seen what he had done, they'd heard him speak, and he spoke with such conviction that they just dropped everything and followed him. I'll make you fishers from men, he said to the fishermen. To the tax collector, one of the most despised people, he said, follow me, and he left it all behind and went with him, as did the others. But still they get there and they're not quite sure. I said you don't know what it's like to be a slave. We can't even begin to think what it's like to be a slave. And I don't think there are probably many people here who know what it's like to really be hungry. Unless you live through the Depression. My father, to the day he died, would not eat a turnip, look at a turnip, didn't want to smell a turnip. Because he had so many turnips during the Depression. And my grandmother would mix them in with mashed potatoes. And he said it ruined the mashed potatoes. He would rather have had a spoonful of mashed potatoes than three spoonfuls of turnip and mashed potatoes. Very few of us know what it is like to be very hungry. Maybe you skip breakfast, maybe your stomach's growling, and if it growls in the pew, you always look around and say, who is that doing that, right? 
And when kids say to me, I am starved, I say, no, you're not. You're just a little hungry. But can you imagine what it is like for people who never, ever in their lives had enough to eat, to eat their fill and have leftovers? How many of us turn up our nose at leftovers? They had never, they didn't even have a word for leftovers at that point because nobody ever had anything left because you would eat a little bit if your kids, you'd feed them first and then you'd eat a little bit, just like in the Depression, just like poor people do now because there are people, unfortunately, who are hungry in the world today people probably within a mile of this building who are hungry today, even though we have enough, this planet produces enough to feed everyone, but we doubt the ability of things to change, and so we are satisfied with the way things are. But they ate their fill and collected up the pieces that were left, 12 baskets full. Maybe that doesn't seem like a lot of leftovers for feeding 10,000 people, but 12 is one of those numbers, like the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples. It's a number that has great significance. Like the number 10,000 was the biggest number they had of the day. We're talking abundance. We're talking grace that overflows and continues to roll through that hillside and those people. And also, John is the one who says Jesus in chapter 10, refers to himself as the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, echoing the words of his ancestor, King David, who wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He makes me to lie down where? In green pastures. John is careful to say that this is a place with a great deal of grass so that when the people sit down, they understand that they are in God's shepherd's care. They're in their shepherd's care. They're in that pasture of plenty. People who would know nothing but want, know plenty. Do we trust God? So we've got to ask ourselves that every day. And I would say, man, to some extent we do, and even me to some extent. I'm telling you what, my faith is not perfect. My faith gets tried. My faith gets battered and bruised along the way. But we need to remember these stories because these are stories of power and grace. These are stories that remind us that even if we think we're insignificant and worthless and got nothing to give, all we have to do is place it in God's hands and we will be able to have God do tremendous things through us, sometimes in spite of us, but often through us with the Holy Spirit. If we allow the Holy Spirit into our life, into our congregation, into our work, into our daily thinking, into our prayers. We will be unstoppable. We will have abundant grace because everything is possible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Feeding 10,000 people from one kid's lunch or overcoming hunger, overcoming poverty, overcoming addiction, overcoming sinfulness, overcoming doubt and despair, overcoming depression, overcoming anything the world can throw at us. God is able to care for us and redeem us and make us whole and set us on a new path and through us do that for the world. We just have to believe it and let it happen. I told you I choose to think that this boy went to Jesus with the faith of a child and said, here, Lord, it's not much, but take it. Do with it what you will. Reminds me of another story that I read years ago from Chicken Soup for the Soul. Please don't give me the books. I got them all. I've had, when you're a pastor, you tend to get angels. People say, oh, you collect angels? No, people just give me angels. And I have all these Chicken Soup for the Soul books, and the only one I really liked is the first one that came out. I'm pretty sure this is the story from that book. It's a true story. There was a drought in the U.S., in the Midwest. Crops were dying. Farms were closing. People decided they needed to pray. After everything else failed, they turned to God. Don't we do the same sometimes? Everything else isn't working. Let me try prayer. They had a prayer service, an interfaith prayer service, in one of the fields. They told people, bring a sign or a symbol of your faith. Bring the symbol of your faith. The Christians brought a big old cross, big ginormous cross. One denomination said, we can bring a bigger cross than that. They had all these big crosses. The Jewish part of the community brought a Star of David. 
Everyone brought symbols. They wore prayer shawls. They wore their vestments. They did all these things. But then there was a kid in the crowd. Guess what he brought? Anybody know this story? Umbrella. He brought an umbrella. Because if that's not a sign of faith, what is? If you think it's going to rain, if you ask God, and you have your umbrella in your hand, you're ready for a miracle to rain down like manna from heaven. So I hope for you what I hope for myself is when we come to these moments that we'll be the kid with the lunch or the kid with the umbrella. We will hold on to this notion no matter how foolish the world tells us we are that with God nothing is impossible, that God can take us as insignificant as we feel, as limited as we feel, as little as we feel, as scrawny as we feel, as useless as sometimes we have been told we are, that God can take us and turn us into something spectacular because God will work through us to change the world. Toby, I'm looking at you. Toby gives me great feedback on my sermons, and I do enjoy feedback on my sermons, believe it or not, unless you're saying every time. But last week we were talking, it was the last week, and we were talking about seeds, planting seeds, sowing seeds, the agricultural parables from Matthew 13. And Toby is a landscape architect, so she knows plants and trees. Everybody's always calling her, asking her tree questions, plant questions. Last week was the wheat and the weeds. Talking about, I am not God's what? Weed whacker, remember that? I'm not God's weed whacker. I was not called to weed out God's garden, just my own plot. But Toby told me something great that goes so well with this sermon that it didn't get in last week, it's getting in now. If you want to get rid of weeds, what you need to do is sow seed or plant things that are going to take over. What if we did that? What if we went into the world where there's need and replaced it with hope? What if we walked alongside those who are suffering and struggling, offering them a kind ear or a shoulder or a place to be? What if as a congregation we said, forget what they said about people being hungry. We're going to feed anybody who comes. The congregation that baked the cookies, the 14,000 cookies, you know how much it takes to send 14,000 cookies to Iraq? Over $1,000. Not only do we have to come up with the money to bake the cookies, we had to come up with the money to send the cookies, but the most miraculous thing happened when we were pushing that big old cart through Sam's Club, people were saying to the two of us, because, I mean, we were really shoving this cart, and I was younger then. I could push. One of us was pushing. One of us was pulling. It was so way down, and people came up and said, what are you doing? Do you work for a restaurant? We said, no, we're from Hedgesville United Methodist Church. We're baking cookies to send to Iraq to soldiers. People opened their wallets. Some man gave us $100 right then and there. Between the section with the flour and the sugar and the chocolate chips and the cash register, we had about $300 in donations. A woman in the congregation worked for the Chrysler Corporation. She told them what she was doing, and we had three packs of playing cards times 856 people. They weigh a lot to mail, but still, it was a great thing to do. Somebody called up and said, what else would the soldiers like? And they said, you know what? We really need hot sauce because meals ready to eat are meals not worth eating, and hot sauce is a great commodity. Someone called Taco Bell and said, do you think you could give us maybe a few? And they gave us thousands of packages of hot sauce. Because when you let God work in you, it sort of shows on you. And people start to get on board with it. And people will give and people will believe because of your faith, the power of your faith. I went to the next church remembering the 14,000 cookies. I was never going to ask that again. But that church gave meals out at Christmas time and bought gifts for kids in the local school. And they always started the meeting by saying, how many do we think we can do this year? And somebody said, maybe we can do 20. I don't know. Maybe we should start with 10 and see where it goes from there. And I said, what if instead of saying, what am I able to do? What if we said, God, what do you need me to do? They said again, Pastor, you're crazy. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, we could buy us a new air conditioning system for the whole church and probably the whole community. You're crazy. What if we, what if we get more than we can do? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? How, Pastor, how? Through the power of God's Holy Spirit taking hold of this congregation. And so instead of saying, this is what we're willing to do, we went to the guidance counselors at three schools 
and said, any family who needs help, send them to us. And we went from doing 20 boxes to 102 that year without any trouble at all. We went to Walmart and set up a station and said to people as they were on their way in, could you buy us an extra item? We gave them a list of things we needed to do these dinners. We gave them a list of things that we needed for kids. Some people walked by, of course they did. Some people said, one man came up and got in my face and said, if they're too lazy to work, they're too lazy to eat. And I said, what about their children? He said, they shouldn't have had them. And I said, God bless you, and walked away before I plunked him in the side of his head. <laughs> one woman went in and said, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm only here for one thing. And she read the list, and she saw what we were doing, and she came out with an entire cartload of groceries, pushed it up, took her item off the top, and said, God bless you. A Muslim family came out with four turkeys and said, thank you for giving us a way to help our neighbors. Because this kind of thing spreads through you. So you could be one of the disciples who should know better, but says, how could this be, Lord? Or you can be the kid with the lunch or the kid with the umbrella. So that God is able to work through you to do all that God has asked you to and even more. That's what Jesus says, too, in that last time he has with his disciples in John 14. All the things you've seen me do, you're going to do this and more. You just need to believe it. May God grant us the grace to believe all that we are capable of doing through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen, amen, amen.